The Bible warns us against talking too much or being overly talkative. Ecclesiastes 5.3 For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. Ecclesiastes 10.14 A fool also multiplies words. No man knows what is to be. Who can tell him what will be after him? If there is one book that understands human beings and human nature, it is the Bible. The Bible reveals human beings and human nature like no other. And this Holy Bible gives us a tremendous amount of wisdom and advice on how we should live our lives in this fallen world with sinful mankind. The Bible even reveals how discretion can protect one's plans, dreams, and personal life from unnecessary scrutiny, jealousy, or sabotage. And unfortunately, uh, as a pastor, one thing I have seen many Christians suffer with is the issue of being naive. Brothers and sisters, not everyone in life wants the best for you, even if they present themselves as wanting the best for you. Some people you will meet in life will have ulterior motives. The Bible reveals instances of this. For example, Samson and Delilah in Judges chapter 16. Delilah is someone who had complete ulterior motives. She smiled in Samson's face, but at the drop of a hat, she was willing to send this man to his grave. The story of Samson and Delilah, as mentioned, serves as a powerful cautionary tale about the perils of disclosing too much. Samson, endowed with immense strength by God, ultimately met his downfall due to his indiscretion. Trusting Delilah with the secret of his strength, he exposed his vulnerability. This story in the Bible underscores the critical importance of being cautious about what we reveal, especially regarding our strengths and weaknesses. It teaches us that not every confidant is worthy of our trust and that sometimes silence can be our greatest protector. Silence can be our greatest protector. Imagine, just imagine what Samson could have become if his life and potential had not been cut short because of talking too much. Imagine, just imagine what Samson could have achieved, the heights he could have scaled, had his life and potential not been prematurely curdled due to his proclivity for talking too much. As a man blessed with unparalleled strength, a gift directly from God, Samson was not just an individual with physical prowess. He was destined to be a leader, a protector of his people, and a pivotal figure in the history of Israel. A man as strong and as gifted as Samson, unfortunately, was a naive individual who left himself exposed. This is the point of my sermon today. Choose to be wise with the information you share and who you share that information with. You live in a world full of sinful people, just like we are also sinners saved by the grace of God. The world you live in is full of people who get jealous, who are envious, who do not want the best for you. I, I'm sorry to tell you, but that is the world you live in. And reflecting on what could have been, we are reminded of the profound impact our words and actions can have on our destiny. Samson's story is not just a tale of what was, but a poignant reminder of what could have been if only wisdom had guided his speech and actions. Genesis 37, 3 to 20. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and, lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him, yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And, behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father, and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him, and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him. 
But his father observed the saying, and his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren, and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. The early life of Joseph is a great lesson in wisdom and knowing how to interact with people. Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, and for this reason his brothers hated him. In the passage of scripture we just read, we see that Joseph went on to have two dreams, the first of which he told his brothers, which clearly was not the most intelligent decision. He then had a second dream. If Joseph was unwise to tell the first dream, knowing how irritating it was to his brothers. Then it was worse to share this second dream. The second dream was likely to cause even more resentment because it set him not only above his brothers, but also above his father and mother. The immediate result of Joseph's sharing his dream was that his brothers hated him even more and also envied him in their hearts. He was his father's favorite, chosen to receive the blessing of the firstborn, wearing a special garment, and now the recipient of strange dreams from God. There is no way for us to know how different Joseph's journey would have been to the fulfillment of those dreams if he had not talked too much. But what we do know is that the Bible advises us to be wise and wisdom is not in talking too much. Talking too much will get you into trouble. The whole world does not need to know what you are doing and where you are going. And the truth is not everyone is rooting for you. We live in a fallen world and unfortunately, the truth is not everyone wants the best for you. Not everyone will be happy when God blesses you. Human beings are more complicated than this. A human being can hate you for years and pretend they are actually your friend or a loved one for years. Human beings are complicated beings. We have the ability to hide our emotions, to harbor grudges emotions behind smiles for years while plotting and scheming against someone. In a perfect world, there would be no jealousy, no envy, and no resentment. However, we don't live in a perfect world. People don't need a reason to despise you and wish you harm. You can do the right thing, the good and honorable thing, and some people will still despise you for doing that. Cain murdered his very own brother simply because Abel did the right thing. This tells me about the true extent of human nature. Even those who share your last name could be your biggest haters. You didn't speak ill of them. You didn't steal their opportunity. You didn't steal their shine, their thunder, or their position. They simply had a problem with you because of the simple reality that God has blessed you. The wonderful thing about God is that he will bless you even more simply because they hate you for the blessings he has given you. You need to come to the understanding that you can't live your life trying to please people. You need to aim to please God and God alone. Get to the point where whether someone likes you or doesn't like you doesn't determine how you live your life. Make peace with the fact that some people won't like you for no reason. Some people will not like you for no apparent reason and that is life. Get over it and no matter what you do they won't like you. They don't like the way you look. They don't like where you come from. They don't have a reason to dislike you but yet they do. 
The Bible acknowledges a thing called enemies. The people in the Bible had enemies and you have them too. One of the most wonderful things about God is that he does not judge you based on your enemies or who likes you and who doesn't. Psalm 23, 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God doesn't need anyone's approval to bless you. God is not swayed by other people's opinions of you. He is a God who can bless you in front of your enemies. And there is nothing they can do to stop what God is doing in your life. Nothing. Carry on living your life. Carry on dreaming your dreams. And the people who are going to love you will continue to love you. While those who are going to hate you will continue to hate you. I have even discovered that you do not necessarily have to offend someone before they become your enemies. The mere fact that you are being blessed is an offense to them. That's just life. It's not fair. But life is not fair. Don't talk too much. Don't go around telling everyone your business. Don't be so quick to share secrets about your marriage with other people. I am not saying don't go to Christian counseling. No. What I am saying is don't just talk about your private matters to everyone. Some of the people you are telling about the challenges in your marriage are happy you are going through those challenges. They are pleased to see you struggle. Don't go around talking too much. Don't just open up to people and reveal your weaknesses. I am not against Christian counseling. Christian counseling is good. Uh, however, what I am saying is just don't go around picking random people like Sister Flip Flop and Brother Watermelon and begin to talk about your failures, faults, and weaknesses. If you need someone to talk to, talk to God in prayer. Be 100% honest with God in prayer, and He will hear and counsel you. People talk themselves into bad situations and then blame God for the situation they are in. Don't talk your way into trouble. Your social media following does not need to know every detail of your life. In a similar vein to the lessons we learn from Samson and Delilah, and Joseph and his brothers, the account of Nehemiah's work to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem presents another compelling example of the wisdom and discretion. Nehemiah, tasked with a monumental and risky endeavor, chose to conduct his initial survey of the walls under the cover of night, keeping his intentions close to his chest. This was not an act of secrecy for its own sake, but rather a strategic move to ensure the success of his mission. By not revealing his plans prematurely, Nehemiah was able to assess the situation, devise a plan, and then rally support without the hindrance of early opposition or discouragement. His approach exemplifies a profound understanding that sometimes the path to achieving God's work requires us to move quietly, thoughtfully, and with discernment. Nehemiah's story teaches us that there is a time to speak boldly and a time to work quietly, always guided by wisdom and a keen sense of the situation at hand. This balance of silence and action, undergirded by prayer and a reliance on God, is what ultimately led to the successful rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls and serves as a testament to the power of wisdom and leadership in undertaking God's work. Wisdom requires you to be silent at times. Wisdom is sometimes silent. Wisdom does not talk to much. Wisdom is sometimes keeping private matters private. Wisdom is knowing when to speak and when not to speak. Finally, in all your conversations, let the Holy Spirit always guide you. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Today, I want to draw your attention to a beautiful promise found in Isaiah 54, 17 which reads, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. The context of this verse is crucial to understanding its true meaning. In this chapter, the prophet Isaiah is addressing the people of Israel, who had just returned from Babylonian captivity. They were a broken and defeated people, having endured years of suffering and hardship. But in this chapter, God promised to restore them, to make them flourish and prosper once again. He promises to rebuild their cities and walls, to increase their numbers, and to make them a great nation. And in the midst of this promise, 
God assures them that no weapon formed against them would prosper. This is not only a promise of physical protection, but it was also a promise of spiritual protection. God was assuring them that despite their enemies, they would remain victorious because He was with them. Today, as we look at this promise, we can see how it applies to us as God's children. Just as the people of Israel faced physical and spiritual enemies, we too face enemies in our daily lives. Isaiah 54, 17 No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. What does Isaiah 54, 17 really mean? It means the Lord will not allow the weapons formed against His children to prosper. In other words, the objective of that weapon being formed against you will not come to fruition. It will not succeed in its mission. Notice how the Word of God mentioned the fact that weapons will be formed. In other words, you may go through some tests and some battles, but those battles will not destroy or accomplish the plan of the devil in your life. God has not fallen asleep on the job. God never sleeps, and He never slumbers. He is watching over. Sometimes, this means the Lord takes the weapon out of the hand of the enemy of His children. Sometimes, it means that God allows the weapon to strike, but brings a greater good out of it than the pain of the immediate blow. Isn't that amazing that we serve a God who is able to turn bad situations into the best things that have ever happened to you? Isn't it amazing that God is a God who can turn bad situations good and good situations better? Genesis 50, 20 But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Look at that phraseology. God did not say no weapons will be formed, full stop. No. God said the weapons will be formed, arrows will be thrown. But what God assured you and me is that they will not prosper. They will not accomplish the purpose it has been sent to do. So don't be afraid. The Lord is telling you today that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. What are you afraid of? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. What are you scared of? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. What are you worried about? Romans 8, 31 What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Answer this question today. If God be for us, who or what can be against us? Answer this question today. If God be for you, who or what can be against you? Can sickness be against you? No. Can persecution be against you? No. Can calamity be against you? No. Can death be against you? No. Can heartache or trauma or suffering be against you? No. 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 Romans 8.31 is a reminder that no matter what challenges we may face in this life, we have a God who is on our side. When we face difficulties, we may feel like we are alone and that the world is against us. But this verse reminds us that with God on our side, we are never truly alone. God is a powerful ally who can provide us with the strength and courage we need to face any obstacle that comes our way. And while others may be against us, if God is for us, what does it matter? With God, you are the majority and not the minority. As Christians, we will undoubtedly face suffering and trials in this life. We may experience persecution, discrimination, and even oppression because of our faith. But we can take comfort in knowing that we serve a God who is greater than any of these challenges.